right, good morning. This is Sunday School. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Acts in chapter number 19. Acts chapter number 19. We're going to pick up here in verse number 8, and we're going to read through the uh, vagabond Jews, who were the seven sons of one named Sceva, who went out and performed, uh, tried to go and perform an exorcism. And uh, unfortunately, they failed pretty miserably at that. They tried to do it in the name and power of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Apostle Paul. But unfortunately, they were not sent from God to do that. They took it upon themselves to go out and do that. And as a result, we'll see the, the failure that, that resulted. But we will also see that through that physical manifestation of the spiritual world, that means that you actually are not just seeing spiritual war- warfare. You're seeing spiritual warfare turn into physical warfare. It scared people. I'm going to tell you that during the tribulation that takes place on this earth, there are going to be people who are going to be downright scared about what takes place. When they see what takes place, when they understand the spiritual realm and how powerful it is, they're going to try to do everything they can to to die. They want to get out of this place. And unfortunately for them, it's not going to happen. Let's get into some of this and and talk in Acts chapter number 19 and verse number 8. It says, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly. This is the Apostle Paul. He's there in Ephesus, which is a part of Asia. He goes into the synagogue. He spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened, that's when the multitudes were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way, Before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one, Tyrannus. Now, just looking at these verses, just for a second before we move on, when you see in verse number 8 that he speaks for the space of three months, disputing, persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God, how many individuals in your life have you talked to about the gospel? Probably quite a few. How many of them have you talked to, and you talk to them once, and then you're like, oh, that guy's never going to believe it. It's, it's It's just over. There's people that I've talked to for years, in years, in years, in still years. I have one friend, I've been talking to him for a decade about it. We just talked last night again for a decade. And, I'm, I, and I try to persuade him. And I sit there and ask him, why not? Right? What is preventing you? What do I need to do? What can I show you from the scripture? You know? And it's almost like nothing. They, they're so, what, what causes that though? Pride. Right? The love of money. Right? There's so many pieces to, to the, the, um, the, the hurdle. I would consider it to be it's, it's, it's a hurdle to, to get to that point of belief because their mind has been so corrupted and polluted and they're so far deceived. Right? And what they'd have to do is they'd have to take, well, I don't know, 20 years of their life and say, oh, well, 20 years of my life, that was a big waste of time. Right? Well, better 20 years now than be dead. Right? And have no choice. So with these guys here with Paul, you know that, that he's going to do what as it relates to the gospel? When he goes out and he preaches the gospel, what's he, how, much, how much effort is he going to give? As much as in him is. Right? He's going to go out and give as much effort as he possibly can to the point that he just keeps going into the night. And people are going to see in you know, Eutychus in the next couple of chapters. He falls out of, out of, out of the window and, and it's so late. At night, because he's continually preaching. We get a little frustrated sometimes when the pastor or the preacher goes for, you know, 45 minutes. Oh, God forbid an hour, right? And, and that really, why, why does that normally take place? Well, because you're, you know, you're accustomed to that. You're accustomed to just having that small bit of, of Bible time. And I, I realized over, over my time, of course, studying with Russ and with Frank, that an hour is nothing. I mean, an hour is a joke. We used to, I used to go into Russ's office at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, okay, we got to get out of here by like, you know, 8, 8.30 at the latest. Okay, okay, okay. You know, l- lunchtime, 1 o'clock. We're still sitting there. We're still talking. And, and I look at my clock, and I'm like, how did, how did it go? And it goes so quickly, right? If you ever, if you ever like, you know, w- watch a movie and you're really into it, and then you, it's a two-hour movie, you realize, wow, that was, that was two hours, but I didn't feel like it was two hours. It was, it was so quick because you were enjoying it, right? These individuals, when Paul, of course, speaks with such authority, he, he, he obviously has, um, you know, he has something to say, Right? And that's the number one thing about evangelism is you have to do what? You have to know what to say. You have to have something to say. And I'd say the majority of uh, the people I know who do not preach the gospel or talk about the gospel is because they really don't know much about it, right? And so if they're confronted and, and, and they're uh, you know, asked a question that might be tough, they're going to fall on their face. They're not going to understand how to do it. 
So for Paul, he sits here and he disputes and persuades things concerning the kingdom of God for three months. He just spent, as we see in Acts chapter number 18, he spent a year and a half at the church at Corinth, right? So people always go, you know, that's a long, that's a long time, right? And if you look at what Paul talks about, he has, he doesn't have a year and a half worth of unique sermons. Does that make sense? Right? There's a, there's a simplicity as it relates to the scripture. Do we understand that? That there's a simplicity to the gospel, and there's a simplicity to what, what is be called the revelation of the mystery that's given to the apostle Paul. And then there is a simplicity as it relates to the scriptures of the prophets and the things that are written before time, right? Which we use for our learning and we go back. We're going to look at some stuff today in Habakkuk. We're going to look at some stuff in, in, in Jeremiah and Micah. Great, great passage of scripture. I don't go there every day, right? My everyday passages are, are you know, Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, as being uh, authoritative for the applicability of, of my spiritual life today. So when he goes here in verse number 9, he says, when divers were hardened, that means that majority of people did not, did not do what? Did not believe his message. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but what did they do? Notice this. They speak evil of that way before the multitude. Well, why would they do that? What does Paul say in the book of Thessalonians about the Jews? What do they do? Forbidding them to speak to the Gentiles that they what? That they might be saved. Remember that? Remember how, remember how they just get subversive in that nature? They think they're doing the work of God. They think they're doing things that are right. But they're, 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 they're saying that Paul's ministry is evil. I can assure you that if you look through all the scriptures, and even when Paul gets put on trial here shortly, okay, they have nothing to say, right? They, they have nothing to accuse them of. Where's the accusers? Bring them forward. Just like when they had to bring Jesus Christ, what do they have to do? They had to bring in false witnesses to say, oh, yeah, he's doing that, he's doing this, he's doing that. They didn't have anything. It's all a lie. So with the Apostle Paul, what you're going to see is he, he disrupts the normal flow of the religious system there in Asia. Okay? The religious system in Asia is one of witchcraft, necromancy, uh, soothsaying, sorcery. It, it, it's some weird stuff, right? And they're, they're dabbling in that spiritual world. And most people would say, that, that sounds weird. That sounds like something that is from a movie. Well, where do you think they get it from? Right? Where do you think the movies get the ideas for the things that they do? Right? They, they get them from the spiritual world. And they get them from the scripture. When you keep reading here in verse number 9, it says, When divers are hard and believe not, but spake evil that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So that's the philosophical aspect of, of being prepared to discuss the Bible, being prepared to discuss the gospel, and not just be able to discuss it, but also do what? Defend it, right? And the defense of the gospel is, is, is what Paul says. He says, I am what for the, de for the defense of the gospel? I am set for the defense of the gospel. When you're set, what do you do? When you're, when you're, when you're doing concrete, what do you, what do you wait for? You wait for the concrete to set. Has it set yet? Can I put the post in? Is it ready to be set? Is, is it good? Is, is, it, is it hardened? Right? And as Paul talks about in the book of Corinthians, he says there's no foundation that can be laid than that which has been laid. Right? Which is what? Christ Jesus. Then he tells the people, he says, take heed. Right? How every man does what? Buildeth thereupon. Okay? So when you start building thereupon, I can show you that the stuff that's happening here is not the stuff that they want to be building upon. The church at Ephesus had a major issue with, with witchcraft, with this curious arts, with these relics, these books, this weird spiritual demonic activity, right? That's what they were involved in. Many that believed, we're going to see, many that believed were still involved in this process. And why is that? Well, it's an aspect of sanctification. The sanctification that you have at the moment time you believe the gospel is positional with God. God says that you are in Christ, right? Christ is in you. And as a result of that, what does he say in the book of Romans chapter number 8? Nothing can separate you, right? Absolutely nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing. Zero, okay? Now, your day-to-day -day life, you don't necessarily always believe that, right? You don't, nor do you necessarily operate practically in that manner. Sometimes you do. Many times you don't. So the maturity level of the believer is one that does what? 
realizes the old man and the new man. That's it. That, that, that's your number one most important thing that I would say, okay, you believe the gospel, what's next? Let me teach you about your old man and your new man, right? Let me work on that one for a while. Let me teach you about the spirit and the flesh. Let me show you that which is enmity against God, right? And let me show you how they that are in the spirit can please God. So when Paul spends his time here, he says in verse 10, he continued by the space of two years. Why? Well, look, if you're going to give it all, you might as well give it all. So that all which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Remember what he says? Those things you have both seen and heard in me. What does he say? Do? Remember that? I go, that's yeah, pretty good. Pretty good advice, right? My daddy used to always say, hey, you are the company that you keep, right? He said, don't be hanging around with that guy. You need to be hanging around with the right people because they influence you. And the Apostle Paul does have a great sphere of influence. And as we're going to see, God uses him in verse 11 with special miracles, which we stated were miracles that are not normal, right? Special miracles, meaning that they're, they're extraordinary. They're something that was not occurring on a regular basis. It's a special time. So he does these special miracles by the hands of who? Paul, for a specific purpose. And as we've kind of been studying, I'll kind of wrap this up a little bit. He did these special miracles for the purpose of demonstrating what? The power. The power that, that he truly has through Christ Jesus. Not the power that these individuals, as they're called, the vagabond Jews exorcists possess. That's the fake power. They don't have any power. They, they act like they do. A vagabond Jew, what is that? What's a vagabond Jew? When do we see the word vagabond? Traveling. A traveler. Well, you see it with, with Cain in the book of Genesis. He, he, he's like, you're going to be a traveler. You're going to be a vagabond, right? You're going to go out and just do. So what does he do? What does Cain do? He's got no home. He just keeps traveling throughout. So for these individuals here, being vagabond Jews, then it says, comma, exorcists. Are they really exorcists? Well, clearly not, right? Clearly not. They do what? Who do, who's similar to these guys right here? We study this in the book of Acts, in chapter number 8. Simon. Remember Simon the sorcerer? What did he do? What does the scripture say in Acts 8? Look at it. He says he held himself out to be what? Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitch the people of Samaria. Why? Well, he wanted that prideful power. He wanted that ability to, for somebody to go, ooh, look at Simon. But what did he also do? He profited in it, right? That's the number one reason why these guys are doing it. They're doing it to make money. And it says, he bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Notice that, giving out that himself was some great one. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. But see, when Philip comes down from into Samaria, right, when he, when he flees the persecution of Saul of Tarsus, and he comes down to Samaria and he starts preaching Christ unto them, and the unclean spirits, in verse number 7, crying with a loud voice, came out, of, came out of many that were possessed with them. Clearly, Simon sees this and goes, Whoa. I don't have this power. This is something I need, right? And then he goes through that process. In verse 11, it says, To him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with their sorceries. And he wanted to pay. He wanted, the, he wanted to buy the Holy Ghost. He wanted that power. He didn't want it for the right reasons. He wanted it still for nefarious purposes, which was really to profit. And so just like these guys here, these vagabond Jews, exorcist, in verse number 13 of chapter 19, notice what it says. He held, him, he held himself out to be some great one. They did what? They took upon them. They took the power. They said, we're going to do this. We're going to take it upon ourselves to go out and do that. Ooh, that's never a good thing to do. Especially when you start acting in the name of God. You better be a sent one, right? You better be an apostle if you're going to get out there and start doing that stuff. Because if you ain't sent from God and you start saying you're of God, what do you become? You, became, you become a false prophet. You become a liar. So it says here, he took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. So notice this. It's very interesting. And people ask that verse in Matthew chapter 7. Did, did, 
Lord, Lord, did we not in thy name cast out? Lord, Lord, did we not try to do these things, right? It's a very similar type of situation. Number one, the fact that they're vagabond Jews, they're still identifying as being Jews. And they have, a, they have as it says here in a second, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew who was a what? A chief of the priest. How many chief priests do you know? Raise your hands. I'm serious. None. I don't know any chief priest besides one. Who's the only chief priest we know? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's the only chief priest that we know. So if you're still operating with chief priests, what's the issue there? You're missing it. You're mi if, if Jesus Christ has already come and gone, and you didn't get that he was your chief priest, you might need to read the book of Hebrews, right? You might need to read that and go, oh, okay, I see, I see. I see, what the, I see what the purpose of that chief priest was. We have no need for that anymore, right? So with these individuals here, <clears throat> they took it upon themselves to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. Now notice this. <clears throat> the reason why they did this is because who was doing this before them? Paul. They saw Paul doing it, and they go, <laughs> we want to do it too. Why? Well, because they're going to start losing. They're going to start losing those people if they don't have that ability over them. We need to keep. We need to figure out how that he's doing this stuff. We're going we're to do it. All we got to do is walk on. Apparently, this is probably what Jesus Christ. This is probably what Paul did. Paul just would come in and he'd go, "I adjure you by the name of the Lord Jesus," and that's what would happen. You don't believe me? Let's look. Go to Acts sixteen. This is what takes place in Acts chapter number sixteen. <clears throat> in verse number sixteen. Paul comes. He finds a, a certain damsel. She's possessed with the spirit of divination. Guess what the spirit of divination does? Listen to me. If the love of money is the root of all evil, I want you to think about that. The love of money is the root of all evil. What would the spirit of divination, what would the spiritual world be trying to get people to do? Get more money. Look, just get more. Get more, get more, get more. And notice what it says here. The certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters, what does it say? Much gain. Look, money. We're going to see it again in just a second. The people get real mad. You start touching their purse, they're not going to like it. You start messing with the way that they get their money, and you're going to see, the, you're going to see a nasty side of somebody. I will tell you. I work for some of the biggest law firms in this area, guys who bill out at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour, okay? You start getting into their money, you watch how disgustingly evil they become. You sit in, the, you sit in a room with 30, 40 lawyers who are all partners in a law firm, and they're arguing about money, you might as well just be like, Satan, I, I see it right there. I mean, I see it, plain as day, he's there, that's what he looks like. Looks like those 30 guys arguing about dollars. And it just gets, it gets so gross. They, I, mean, you, I actually get repulsed by it. I watch them and I'm just like, you guys are worrying about $10 in the scope of, you know, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. You're worrying about the $10 you can save on this thing because you don't think that that's enough. And, and you just go like, wow, that's, and, 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 and like how they, how they become such misers, you know, how, how they, how they'll, they'll, they'll talk about the budget and they won't give a paralegal the raise that they need, you know? Meanwhile, this person's making four, five, six million dollars a year, and the paralegal who's doing 98% of the work is making $32,000 a year. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. And they just, they treat them as slaves, basically. And they say, you're disposable, I'll get another one of you. Just keep doing it, and keep doing that cycle, and do that cycle, do that cycle. And I'll tell you, the good ones maintain good, their paralegals, there's good ones out there. They pay them very well, they make lots of money, and their retention is high. Whenever I go into an office, and I'm about you know, to, 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 to bid a project or to try to secure them as a client. And I, I, I hear about you know, their turnover, or I, I go into their system and I do an analysis and I see there's, you know, there's only 100 people that work there, but there's 8,000 accounts. I'm like, dude, you guys must have turnover left and right. That's never a good sign, right? And I'll tell you that most of the time, that's about money. It comes down to they just keep recycling it because they're not making the money that they think they make. So when you make much gain, okay, and you start messing with their ability to make money, they're not going to like it very much. So what, is, what happens? This, this, this girl here, she started following Paul, right? She started, it says, it says, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying what? Notice this. I want you to read. Look at this. She cried, saying, don't listen to these guys. No, no, what does she do? 
See, she's smarter than that. That spirit knows what it needs to do. And it says, well, look, we'll just get, we'll get, we'll get them all aligned with us and make them think that we're on the same side, right? And by doing that, all the people go, no, 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 that crazy damsel who's, who's been possessed, you are also preaching that crazy heresy too. And so notice what it says. The girl says, these men are the servants of the Most High God. This is the evil spirit speaking through a human being. These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. What a, what a crazy statement, right? Is it, is it really a true statement? Absolutely it is, right? It's just when they, when, when, when the, during Christ's earthly ministry, when the evil spirits start talking about Jesus Christ, and they go, oh, you're, you're the son of the most high God. We know who you are. Remember all that stuff? And what does he do? What does Christ tell him to do? Don't talk. Don't say that. You're not talking about that. And why? Well, he doesn't need them to testify about who he is. What he's going to do is he's going to testify that, yeah, that's correct, but I'm going to show you who's ultimately in control. And that's why they go, Have you, are you come to torment us before the time? Right? They're thinking, see, deep down in the back of their mind, they ain't dumb. They read this. How do they know that? How do they know that they're waiting for the torment to come? Because guess what? They believe the Bible more than most Christians do. They do. They, they believe in God. They believe in this Bible. They know what's in here. They know what the end looks like for them. Right? They have no choice. There's, there's nothing they can do other than to try to do what? Prolong it and frustrate it as much as they can. And that's what they're going to do. So if the will of God today is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, as Apostle Paul says, why is that not happening today? Because the will of God is being frustrated on a daily basis. How? Well, as Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then what? Christ is dead in vain. That's the majority of people do. That's what, that's what really... The evil spirits will do to those involved in Christianity. He'll just get that law of Moses. He'll take it. He'll put it there. And he'll say, yeah, just do that. Yeah, this is, this is what you need to do. It's in the Bible. We'll just do it. And they'll, they'll go out there and they'll live a life of, of uh, utter failure. They'll live a life of complete condemnation. I spent two, three hours last night. Typical thing. Fourth of July party. Somebody's mom was there. Starts talking. They're like, Jason, come over here. She's got some questions for you. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's 9.30. I was ready to go at by 10. They're like, come on, let's have a discussion. Three hours later of talking Bible, right? Three hours later. And I'll tell you, two or three of the people there haven't been coming to our Bible studies in a while. All three of them go, yeah, I really need to get back into that Bible study. <laughs> really need to get back into that stuff, right? Well, why? Because they see it's important at that point, right? This girl, the, the, the mom is a little, she's Pentecostal, so she has a lot of interesting things to talk about. So, uh, I, you know, I, I handle them very graciously. You know, I'm not, I'm not sitting there beating, beating people over the head. I let them just talk. Talk. Talk it up. I'm listening. You know, listen to all the stuff you have to say. She was talking about Hillary's America and how Trump's going to be the next savior of the world and all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm just like, do you forget history? How many times we've done this? We've been, on, we've been through this cycle before, okay? And at the end of the day, what I'm looking for is what Paul, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians. What does he say? What does he say? Come on, about, about having one Lord, that every knee should bow, every tongue should confess, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? That's what I'm waiting for. I'm happy with every. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need anything else, okay? I can, I can sleep peacefully not worrying about the political process. But this person was going pretty much berserk about it. She's like, this is, this is crazy, and there's so many things, and then trying to tie in end times pieces and how Bush is trying to rebuild the temple, and I'm just like, what now? Where are you getting this stuff? This is some, that's, some, that's some cuckoo stuff if I ever heard it. So we got into it for a while, but we spent, we spent quite a bit. And what they don't realize is that Satan's goal for the believer is what? As a serpent beguiled Eve through his what? Through the subtlety. So also should your minds be what? Corrupted from the what? Simplicity that is in Christ. See, what happens is they get so weird, like, yeah, but that crazy verse over there in the book of Habakkuk and the one in Micah and the one over there in Isaiah and the one, dude, there's 300 judges and you're like, whoa, whoa, where are you going? Hold on, hold on. We're, pump the brakes, right? You, you're, 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 yeah, you're pulling, ver I can pull all kinds of crazy verses out there. I can just go from one to one to the other and the other and the other. It doesn't, that doesn't help anybody. You're just creating confusion at this point in time. 
I tell, you know, the, the, the common ones I always talk to, I talk about these all the time, is uh, the, one, the one I talk about a lot is, is 2 Chronicles 7, right? If my people, which are called my name, shall humble themselves, praise face. And I always ask people, say, who said that? And they always go, what? I say, well, who, who said that? What's, who's talking there? And they're like, what? Who's talking? I don't understand. Who's, somebody in there wrote it. What's it all about? And they have no clue. So what if I told you it was Solomon? What if I tell you it was the, the, the dedicatory prayer about the temple? What if I tell you that everything you think that verse means, it doesn't mean, right? It, it has nothing to do with America and has nothing to do with you people, right? And so they'll be like, that's not true. See, they, they, they'll, take those, they'll take those verses that sound good. It becomes bumper sticker gospels. It becomes bumper sticker Christianity. They'll use those verses. And it's sad because you go, look, well, how can you not see this? I look at it and go, that doesn't make any sense that you could just randomly pull a single verse out and just roll with it like that, right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So for, for, for the Christian today, the goal of Satan is to make them ineffective, right? Why do you think we have, like, thousands of different Bibles, okay? Really, why do we have so many different Bible versions? Why do we continue to make more and more and more and more Bibles, right? The love of money. That's why they do it. See, see, the King James Bible is, is an actual Bible that has, um, is in public domain, right? So you can't, you can do whatever you want. You can reproduce it. You can copy it. You can do, you can put it all over the internet. You can, you can do whatever you want with it in terms of reproduction. There's no copyright on it. And I'm going to, some of you guys don't know this, but in, in what they call a derivative work or substantially similar work as it relates to copyright, they cannot make the Bible too similar, they have to keep changing it and changing it to get their copyright. Why would they care to get a copyright? Why do they need the government of the United States of America to say, we're going to protect your Bible? Why do we need that? I thought God preserved his word. Do I need a copyright to preserve the, my Bible? No. So why do they do it? Well, they do it because that's the only way they can make money off of it. And they got to keep going and keep going. I keep protecting it, protecting it. And when you go on your eSword, if you got eSword on your phone, I mean, I go through the Bible sometimes. There's at least 60 or 70 Bibles on there. And you can buy each one for $1.99, you know. <laughs> buy this one and buy that one and buy this one. And you go, well, well, if they're all there, don't they all say the same thing? No. Ask Scott. He did a huge long thing on the, 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 the Bibles and went through and, and gave a, 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 I don't know, how many, 100 pages that thing is probably? At least. So. At least. Of all the different omissions and, and the changes, you go, well, so, so what does that mean? Should we all learn Koine Greek? Well, sure, if you can, great, but good luck, you know. Nobody really speaks it anymore, and it's going to take you a long time to figure that out. i just rather learn the English Bible, right? And we can talk about all the historicity of the, of the English Bible and, and why, we, why we preach out of the King James. And, you know, uh, look, you want to you read from another Bible, great. But when you get to one of those verses that you don't have, you're going to go, Where's, why does mine say something completely different than what yours says, right? It's weird. Mine, mine doesn't have that verse. Yeah. It happens, happens quite a bit, more often than you, than you would actually probably recognize. And they, and they do it through what? Subtlety. Purse. Sometimes just, just a little change there, a little change there, pull that one out, remove the blood of Christ, take this. Just little pieces, right? Little pieces to get you more and more confused. But it's not done. It's done purposefully, right? It's not done without a purpose. So in Acts chapter 16, when this, this girl is saying, these men are the service of the Most High God, these are the ones that show us under the way of salvation, obviously the Apostle Paul does not need her to be doing that, okay? Does not need somebody like her testifying about what he's doing. So this she did many days. But Paul being grieved, why is he grieved? He's sick of hearing about it. He's sick of listening to this girl saying it. He turned and said to the spirit, notice this, he didn't turn and say to the girl, he turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when the master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace, under the rulers, brought them to the magistrates, saying what? See, this is a super important verse because what it shows you is the political system of the day. Rome rules the world at that time. Okay, The Jews had somewhat tiny bit of autonomy as long as it did not mess with anything that the Romans did. They liked the Jews. The Jews did what? They paid their money. They, they keep, keep paying me that money to the Roman government, right? There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Luke chapter number 2. You remember that? People go, well, how does that work? Well, Jesus had to pay his taxes too. He came down there as a result with his, with his father and his mother, right? Why? That's what the Roman government required of them. So what do they do? 
they are going to say, these men being what? Jews. And what does that do? Uh-uh, they don't like that. You start getting, no, 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 no. Okay, hold on. They're, they're, they, we, we let those Jews do certain things to maintain that autonomy, but if they start getting involved, it's going to be a huge problem. You start getting involved in our political system, and that's when the, that's what you start seeing. They start saying that he's going to be, well, look, Herod took it so serious about this, okay, in Matthew chapter 2. Herod was so serious that he got all the Jews together, all the, all the elders, all the chief priests. He comes up to him and he goes, tell me about this so-called Christ. And they go, oh, we know all about him. Let me show you. And he tells them all about him. They weren't dumb concerning that. They knew what the Christ was. They just didn't accept that Christ because why? They did not accept. The Jews of that day, especially the leaders, did not accept Jesus Christ because he, that is Jesus, did not see them as they saw themselves, right? They saw themselves as being righteous. Jesus Christ comes and goes, yeah, not even close. And they go, well, that's fine. We'll just kill you. We're, we believe it, that we're righteous. You can't tell us otherwise. And they're going to continue in that self-righteousness, right? Like how Paul says in Romans chapter 10, right? He gets into that, that they have, that they have a blindness. That, that, they, that they, He says, my, my brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record of God that they have a zeal of God, but not according to what? Knowledge. And so that's the problem. They didn't have that knowledge. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. They, did not, they never submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. And so when he, these men bring them out and say they're Jews, they do exceedingly trouble the city, that gets them into more trouble, right? They're trying to say, oh, they're, they're, they're. what do they really do? They helped the young girl out. That's what they did. They didn't do anything evil. He's suffering as an evildoer, but he's not. Notice what it says. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being what? Being Romans. See, they're trying to get this into a political match where the, the, the Jews would, would, as a whole, suffer the consequences. And that's really why they suffer the consequences. That's why you have the, the destruction of Jerusalem, Right? Destruction of Jerusalem happened as a result of the political instability that, that came through Jesus Christ and from the Jewish leadership, right? The Jews still stay there, including James, right? He's the leader of all those guys there. Acts chapter 21, Paul goes and sees James, and he's there with all the elders, with all the chief priests. And, and Pastor Russ, how many of those do you think believe the gospel? None. So what's he doing there? What's he hanging out with? Well, it's, it's easy to get fall into that corruption. It's easy to fall back into, into what's the, the complacency, right? Remember what happens. He says in Galatians, tells, tells Peter, he goes, you know what? Why are you, a Jew, living like a Gentile, but you tell the Gentiles to live like a Jew? I'm real confused about that. You like living like a Gentile, that is, underneath the grace of God, without the law, but you tell all the Jews, or the old Gentiles, to live like Jews. Why do you do that? Well, because that's what they do today. That's what the church does today. Majority of the church, and this is, this is, yes, this is an encompassing statement. This is very blanket across the majority of the churches. But I implore you to, to go and research it. It's correct. The majority of the churches are 100% Judaistic legalizers, quote unquote, law keepers. That's what they do. That's, what they try, that's how they try to live their life. And I go, man, it's crazy that you do that. Because the more I study the law, the more I'm just thankful for the, the cross of Christ. And I'm, I'm, I'm more thankful that I don't have to be underneath the condemnation that's in the law, right? When it says in Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 19, it says, Now whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. That never changes, right? All the world stands guilty before God, right? John 3, he says, he says the same things, right? They say, oh, well, Jesus came out of the world to condemn the world. Well, yeah, because the world was condemned already. The, the state and position of the world is already condemned. They need a Savior, and the Savior is not going to come from the law of Moses, right? There is righteousness in the law, no doubt. Righteousness that you can't obtain. The righteousness which is by faith says what? Believe. See, in Acts chapter number 16, th these people get mad. They beat them. Look at this. They beat him, they lay stripes upon him, they cast him in prison, and they put him where? In the inner stocks. 
And what I think is so crazy about this is Paul and Silas are praying and they're singing praises. You know what that is? I have learned that whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm fine. That's cool. I have a spiritual mindset. You can throw me in prison. I don't care. Kill me. Because yeah, you know why? I'll come back to life, number one. I've done that already once when you got stoned. But number two, if you kill me, you know what that does? I already have a desire to depart and be with Christ because it's far better. And that just, that just blows most people's minds. Most people's minds, you know, like, oh, I get, you get a cancer diagnosis. Oh, my whole life, it's over. Is it? That's pretty sad that you think your whole life's over now that you got a cancer diagnosis. I mean, you're all the more to see in Christ. Why, what's the problem? And because it's the reality of that situation, right? It, it takes time. I'm telling you. It's not something just overnight you just are like, you believe the gospel one day and you have not a care in the world, right? I had a friend this week. He was in the hospital. He's an airline pilot. He was in the hospital. Had, he's my age. Had like his kidneys shutting down. Had like all kinds of crazy stuff going. I mean like crazy stuff for being super young. Had his kidneys shutting down. Had some pancreas problems. All kinds of crazy stuff. While he's away, um, his house burns down. Like half of his house burns down, right? And I'm just like, this is, yeah, this is pretty nuts, right? So I was talking to his mom, his kid I grew up with. I was talking to his mom, and we were, we were ch you know, chatting back and forth on the internet. And, uh, you know, she's like, set your affections on things above. I don't care. And it's so funny because she, she'll, she'll say that. And she believes it. She's like, it's just shoes and clothes and stuff. I, what do I care, right? I don't need that. I can, I, I can buy more or whatever. It's not a big deal, right? And it's just, to most people, they would think such calamity. And same thing with, with, with Adam being sick. They were just like, ah, whatever. And they don't, they're not freaking out. They're just saying, well, pray for Adam and, and have his spirits be renewed and we'll be over there, you know, helping him out. And it's just, it's such a, to most of the world, they would think that's crazy. Like, how are you so calm and collected during this situation? Well, because you're maintaining that spiritual mindset of peace, right? And so that's what Paul does here. How can you be sitting in the inner stocks after you just got beat? Most of us would be crying, oh, get us out of prison. Oh, somebody call. What's the dude's name? Uh, what's the, what's the, I can't think of the, the, pop, the really popular, uh, what's the, you can pull call Morgan Morgan. Yeah, not those guys. I'm thinking of a way, a way better lawyer than those guys. <laughs> right, right. So, so, some really, some really good lawyer. Call, call him up, you know? And it's just, it, it, they have a, t a completely different mindset on this. And it's crazy. Is I think you would too if you're sitting in prison and suddenly an earthquake happens and all your chains fall off, <laughs> and you're like, and all the people are sitting there like this, and you walk up right to the prison guard, and the prison guard's like, "Well, I'm gonna kill myself because I just <laughs> lost all my prisoners." And he's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, don't kill yourself, don't kill yourself." And then he gives him the gospel, right? And he goes, "Yeah, but how can I, how can I, how can I be saved? What do you mean be saved?" And that whole verse is crazy because some people quote that verse. And they think that, you know, he's asking about how he's going to attain eternal life. And that guy's not asking for eternal life. He's asking, how can I, how can I just save myself from having to die? Because I'm going to have to kill myself as a result of what happens. When I lose prisoners, it's my life. And so they sit there, and, and, and he goes, yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll still be saved in the house. And the guy's like, huh? And he goes, okay, sure, <laughs> sounds good. I'll do that. Sounds easy, right? It does. It is easy. It's the easiest thing. It's the most difficult, easy thing you could do, believe the gospel. Because they sit there and they go, well, that just sounds so, that's it? Just believe the gospel? Yeah, just believe the gospel. Why? Because that's what give, gives God the most glory. You understand that, right? That's what gives him the most glory is when you take him at his word and you believe it. Not going, oh, if you would just show me, give me another sign, let me see that. No, it's not what he's looking for. He's looking for you to take him at his word and believe it. And that faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God comes by the scriptures that we have today. Let's close up with this. we got two minutes and we're done. In Acts chapter 19, we're going to get into this just for a second. I'll, we'll preface it for what goes on next week. Acts chapter 19, verse number 13. The certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, they took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. To do what? And he says, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the men, man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. We're going to pick up next week with this and discuss, that's, that's pretty nuts right there. That's that spiritual world getting into, you know, that physical world and, and leaping upon them.